So a good friend of mine, Helen McKenna, had done this really cool sculpt on a Don Lanning course and uh, she'd had this head she wanted to mould and wasn't confident in moulding everything herself. So I thought, I hadn't worked with epoxies, let's try and do something which would help us both. So she agreed to let me film the process of us moulding this head and I got to learn about some new materials. So let's check out this video and see how it went. So the first thing I'm starting off with is to seal the outside of the sculpt. So this is a clay sculpture, so we want to spray this with a clear car lacquer, um, which kind of seals in the moisture and reduces its likelihood of shrinking and drying over time. And then over the top of that is a spray of wax to give it a protective uh, coat, which will help it later on when we come to molding. So the first thing to do once we've got that sealed is to sort of just look at the sculpt and figure out where we're going to put our seam line, where's a good logical place to put the seam line. And typically it's along the halfway point if you're doing a two part mold um, with a slight bias to behind things like behind the ear, that kind of thing, just where the edge is. Um, so with a, a, a paint marker, go around the outside and just decide and mark where the halfway point is. Look at it from the front and from the back and to determine whether it's the right place to go. And then once we've sort of plotted an approximate path with a paint marker, which shows up quite nicely on the clay, um, sometimes I go in with pins as well and that'll help figure out the direction of the clay wall as well. So if the clay wall has to move, you know, in angle in relation to things like the ears and twists and turns, we can kind of figure that out using the pins. So my normal method is to then kind of go over with clay strips because clay strips are much easier to bend around corners and they can be sort of pressed onto the clay surface of the clay mold um, or the clay sculpt sorry and then once the we've decided where we're going to go i one thing i should point out is i like to mold the back half first and the reason for that is if i mold the back half first where there's less detail it's a much easier thing to mold upright and then we can lay it on its back once that back half is done and then we'll have an easier time of molding the front because we've got gravity on our side so getting to those deep areas like the nostrils and the mouth will be easier with the mold lying on its back so going around in between bits you know with these bits of clay um, and it's nice to use little strips of clay um, some people like to do a bigger piece and then you know get that clay cut to the right size for me it's just easier to use little strips because I can bend them and cut them easily and they'll navigate those curves more readily and then once it's all assembled I'll start using plaster bandage to support it now with the plaster bandage obviously um, to support the back it makes sense to protect the sculpt first so here what I'm doing is going around with a um, paper towel and some water and a brush and just kind of pushing the paper towel into the the sculpt and then over the top of that I can lay in my plaster bandage and the plaster bandage will then sit on the surface of the paper towel uh, and then when we're done we can kind of pull that off carefully and then we'll leave hopefully no residue or any damage on the surface of the sculpt when it comes to removing. Now I've done the clay wall in sections because I don't want to do a really really big clay wall before I do any of the bandage because I have had in the past a lot of clay wall on and then just the sheer weight of it just kind of makes it come off so I'll do a certain amount of clay wall and then when I think it's a bit like playing a game of chicken I think once I'm at that point where it's enough I'll sort of quickly back up the other side with the plaster bandage and then when that's set up I can carry on building onto the clay wall because it's supported. Once the clay wall is all done and it's supported from behind, it's then a case of just carefully tooling it smooth. Here I'm just using a little small tool from uh, this particular one I got in the UK. is from a company called Alec Taranti and it's called a number 92. It's a very well-known mold maker's uh, tool over here because the tip is really good for getting close to the edges and in sort of difficult places. But the flat blade is also very good at stroking down and smoothing out flat mold walls. Okay, the clay wall is now done, so it's time to put the keys on. So here I've got a little joggle making tool or key making tool. And as you can see, I'm powdering it as I push it in each time. The reason being the powder helps it come away from the clay. Otherwise, when you push a tool into clay, sometimes you get like a suction and it would break or damage the clay when you withdraw the tool. So by putting a bit of powder on there, it just gives it something to lubricate the edge without making the clay um, you know, too wet or leaving a residue of anything that's gonna cause a problem later. 
Okay, so once the keys are done, we now give the whole thing a good coat of wax. I have already waxed the sculpt, but the clay that I've used for the wall is bare clay. So in order to help that come away from the, uh, the resin that we're gonna use, I tend to give it a good couple of coats of wax here. I'm using MAC wax. I'll spray it, dry it off with a hairdryer, and then give it another coat so it has two good coats. When it goes matte, that's when you know the wax is dry. And then we're ready to start putting our gel coat on. So the gel coat I want to use on this, I'm using, like I say, epoxies for one of the first times I've ever used it. So it's a little bit clumsy with it, but I, I had fun using it. I chose to use Epoxicoat, which is from Smooth On. And it's a nice gel coat. It seems to be quite fluid. A lot of the gel coats I've seen, the epoxy gel coats, tend to be quite stiff, quite thick, which is tricky for highly detailed sculpts. So I was quite pleased with this stuff because it was quite fluid. Um, and goes into the nooks and crannies relatively easily. Um, as you can see, we're using uh, masks to protect our lungs from any fumes and stuff. Uh, the nice thing about epoxy resins is they don't stink, but they do, do still have fumes. So you must take precautions and protect your gloves, you know, use, protect your hands using gloves uh, to stop any kind of skin contact. Um, so we cover the whole thing. Uh, with this gel coat obviously making sure to go into the deep areas early on and in the keys because obviously whilst it's newly mixed the gel coat's very fluid so that's when we want to hit those deep areas of detail first and occasionally you'll see me working into one of those keys with my finger to try and push out any air bubbles um, and then once that's all covered we can just keep an eye on it and I think it took about half an hour to an hour or so for the gel coat to stiffen up so once it's at a good consistency when it's kind of setting up then we can go in with the next little plan which was to pack out any deep areas and here i'm just using some epoxy paste called uh, freeform air which is also by smooth on and that mixes into a nice kind of paste and it does a really good job of being pushed into and adhering to the epoxy gel coat and basically what i'm trying to do is take out the deep areas and make it a smoother shape so that when we glass over the top with this uh, glass matting it will um, navigate the smoothness much more readily and we're less likely to have air bubbles and problems uh, so once the freeform air has been packed into all those details and we've made the whole thing smoother we'll give it a coat of epoxy resin to help smooth it out and then we go on with some glass so as you can see i've got a big sheet of glass big enough to cover the whole thing and then once that's laid on gently we can laminate that down with some resin. So we go over the whole thing, stippling it down, work from the center outwards and gradually get that piece of glass to sit correctly over the surface as smooth as possible. I'm gonna cut off the excess so that we don't have a big sheet of glass hanging over the side because it might drag on the glass and cause some problems. And also we can use these little strips later on. Uh, and then I'm gonna use little strips all over to um, basically reinforce the edges. I want a good couple of layers all over the whole thing but I want maybe three or four layers on the edge because the edge or the flange is where you're going to be uh, most of the punishment is going to happen that's where you're going to hit it with hammers that's where you're going to use screwdrivers and pry bars to open the mold later so we want to uh, account for that and make sure that the molds are nice and strong so once that's set up we leave it overnight and then in the morning it's time to take the clay wall off so I can remove my plaster bandage uh, and peel away the clay and as you can see the clay is not falling off readily so it's going to take a bit of work to actually get the clay off the uh, epoxy gel coat on the other side um, it's you know clay so it will come away it's just a case of digging underneath it carefully without accidentally digging into your sculpt so um, using um, a water spritzer so you can occasionally get some water in there as well that sometimes helps it separate lift away but a lot of it's just a case of digging in there with wooden tools pulling off chunks of clay carefully and then washing it down with a brush and a sponge when I get up close to the detail I'll often switch to a much softer brush because I obviously don't want to damage that uh, detail of the sculpt with a, a coarse brush and water because even though it's protected you can see the water is beating up nicely on that waxy clay surface and that was why we protected it with the with the you know the sprays but um, you want to be cautious because you don't want to assume it's not bulletproof this stuff so go easy
Okay, so now that is done, you can see here that um, we're able to lay down the sculpt on its back. And this is the bit that I were really looking forward to. So because it's now lying down, getting into those deep areas like the nostrils and the eyes and inside the mouth, that's all going to be much, much easier because we're not fighting gravity. Nothing's going to be dripping down and in the way. It'll all flow into those deep areas. So I mix up my gel coat again. I've got the, the grey epoxy gel coat um it's very important to weigh your materials you know you can see here we're using a set of scales and uh, some people eyeball their stuff but you get a specified amount of catalyst with their resin so you want to make sure that you weigh it out carefully um, partly so you you know you've got enough um, and also that you don't uh, you know um, end up running out of the resin or the gel coat before the other because obviously there's a specified amount Okay, so being that this is lying down, we can really easily work into this with the gel coat, with the brushes. So again, getting into those deep areas, the creases, the, the wall where it hits the sculpt, that little 90 degree angle there, um, inside the nostrils and the eyes, all those kind of areas. We want to really massage that gel coat in there carefully and make sure that we get everywhere covered. Um, so that we've got a nice even thickness all over. It is a textured sculpt, so there's plenty of texture to catch and your gel coat is likely to catch air bubbles if you're not careful so you've really got to work that surface with your brush and make sure you get everywhere so once the gel coat is on i do exactly the same trick as before give it a good coat of um, the freeform air to pack out all those deep areas and again try and smooth out that surface as much as possible and once that's been packed in with the freeform air go over it with some uh, resin to smooth it out and that'll give us a much smoother finish and then over the top of that, we can lay our glass. So I had enough glass to lay two complete sheets over the whole thing. So went on with the first one and then, you know, carefully manhandled the stuff to, to make the, the glass sort of sit as flat as we can. And then from the center outwards, we kind of laminate down with the resin and push out air bubbles as you go. It's inevitable with this shape, we're going to trap a few wrinkles and folds and air bubbles here and there, but we can fix those later. But um, you try and get that, that glass mat down as, as, as evenly as possible. And then as soon as that's down, hit it with another sheet and we will have two good solid layers all over the front. You can see here that we did have a few air bubbles um, and where there were air bubbles, basically I just used a syringe to inject in some more catalyst, catalyzed resin uh, after it all set. And that really helped to, you know, fix these pockets of air. They're not normally a big problem, but it's just nice to fix them if possible. OK, so that's the glass done. But I wanted to do something additional on here. You'll notice I didn't do extra layers on the front um, because I've only got two layers all over the whole thing. But I do want those walls to be stronger. So what I've done is I've opted to try out some plasti paste. As I mentioned, I am experimenting with epoxies because I haven't really used them before. So I've used the gel coat. I've used the resin. I've used some freeform air. Now I'm going to use something called plasti paste, which is a kind of a thick putty, which is an epoxy putty. Uh, quite a stiff thing to mix but once you've mixed it it turns into a kind of like a I know it looks like a kind of a curdled kind of custard um, and it's really nice to sort of spooge in um, again using the tongue stick to kind of distribute it I only mixed up small amounts at a time because I wasn't sure how I was going to get on with this stuff um, and I didn't want to get caught out if, it, if I'd mixed up a large amount and it sets before I get it on but basically uh, I put it around the edge and smooth it out with a brush uh, with a bit of acetone on it and the idea is basically to give that strength that reinforcement on the edge using this instead of additional layers of glass I just wanted to see if it make a difference and it gives me a chance to experiment with the new material so that seemed to work quite well. So I opted for more of that and went around the whole edge on the front. And then that worked well enough that I decided to do some on the back too. So I didn't have enough to do the whole thing on the back, but I just chose a couple of key areas where I figured the screwdriver would be used later and then reinforced some of the back too. Okay, once that had all set, it was a case of being left overnight. Now, 
this did take about a week to do this mold. We probably could have done it quicker, but um, each side, you know, was left for a day before we proceeded to the next one. And then once uh, this paste had been put on, I left that overnight. Uh, so, you know, the whole thing kind of took a, a week. It wasn't a solid week of work, but it took place over the course of a week. So we wanted to give it plenty of time to harden up and be strong enough before we could go in with the, with the saws and cutting. So here I'm using a Fane Multimaster tool, which is basically an oscillating saw so the blade doesn't spin it just kind of rapidly vibrates left and right very very quickly and it's really good at cutting through rigid things and it doesn't cut soft stuff at all so it's similar to the kind of saw that they use for removing casts on broken limbs um, and it's it's a very effective tool for cutting uh, thick fiberglass molds like this and as you can see we're all suited and booted we've got masks on and gloves and also uh, using a vacuum cleaner to suck away this is the workshop vacuum and it's the idea is to kind of get at it at source before it has a chance to go everywhere to drill the holes i'm using a, a six mil uh, tungsten dagger drill bit so it's a really strong uh, drill bit that doesn't blunt easily i've had this for a few years and it still works really well and it's great for thick materials like this one last thing to do is to just make sure the outside is reasonably pleasant to hold on to. So what we've got here is some wet and dry paper and just going over the whole surface carefully trying to find if there's any bits that stick up and especially on the edges and corners and things where there might be bits that would catch you. Um, you kind of work, you know, wipe a gloved hand over it. And the gloved hand is very good at finding little snags that your skin might not otherwise find out until it's too late. Uh, but once that's all sanded down on the outside, then we're ready to pry it open. So I start the process by prying it open using a nylon mallet and you just kind of gently tap around the outside edge until you hear things pop and hopefully uh, if it's been released correctly, which it has, uh, the two halves will separate but obviously being quite a big mold it's all kind of stuck together so we've got to get in there with some screwdrivers, find those splits and then pack it out with um, little wooden tongue depressors. So I use a screwdriver to, to kind of get in and make an opening and then gradually feed in some wooden tongue depressors to gradually widen that gap until eventually the thing does pop apart and we separate and the back half comes off nice and easy. I'm not surprised the back half came off first. There's less detail on there, but all the clays kind of come away with it. So we need to clean that out. And then it's a case of trying to get the front off. And um, what we don't want to do is damage the mold or the, you know, in the, in the act of opening it. Uh, we've made the edges very, very strong so they can be pried against each other. But now that the back half isn't there, there's nothing to lever against. So I'm hoping we can just flex and pull the head out. So what we're doing here is just pulling away as much clay as possible and try and dig it out. And then I kind of pull on the shoulders of the foam core and see if the whole head will pop out, which thankfully it does. Then it's just a case of cleaning out all that excess clay that we don't need. So this clay's been in here for a while because this, I think it was about a year or so between it being sculpted and being brought to the workshop. So the clay in here was quite dry. Uh, so it was easy to pull out. Um, and just be careful when you're pulling out clay that you don't damage the surface of the mold with any tools you might be using. I wouldn't use sculpting tools for this. I'd pull out as much as you can by hand. And then as you can see here, I'm just using wooden tongue depressors to kind of scrape it out, partly because if the tongue sticks break, that's no tragedy, but also the, the wooden tools, the, the wooden tongue sticks don't damage the inside of the mold. Even though this is resin and it's hard, we want to be careful. We don't want to, you know, accidentally chip bits off or scrape into the detail. So once the mold is completely clean, I mean, being clay, we can jet wash it out with water and get that nice and spotless inside. Now it's a case of casting out our silicone positive. So the first step is to help that come out by releasing the entire surface of the inside of the mold with Vaseline. Vaseline is cheap and it's really easy to use. You just use a blow dryer to kind of melt it and then you kind of work it in with a brush coat the entire inside of the mold all over the flange and everything. So the whole thing is slightly oily to the touch. And then once that's done, we are ready to go in with our silicone. There was a little snag here. There was some resin that had crept through the nostril and went behind the sculpt. Um, so we can just break that off and then sand off those sharp bits because that's not going to be necessary in our mold. So the first layer of silicon goes in. So Helen mixed up the color that she wanted for the Cyclops' skin. Uh, so we mixed up some Plat Gel 10, I think it was. 
the right flesh tone and then brushed in the first layer all over. And when you're doing brush ins like this, you've got to stay with the silicone and make sure it doesn't just collect in deep pools in the bottom because of gravity. So we're going to keep brushing up the sides, try and get as even thickness as possible. As soon as it starts to set, we can leave that and go on to the other side and then do the same thing again. And we're going to build up maybe two or three coats like this before we add a thickened layer. So here you can see the inside of the eye has already been filled with coloured silicone. So we've got the brown and the white of the eye uh, done as two separate mixes. And the idea of that is if we can pre-do uh, the eyes, it means when the piece comes out, the white of the eye and the brown of the eye is already in the piece. So we don't actually have to apply the colour to the surfaces heavily because the pigment's already in there. And once that silicone in the eye had set, we did the same again. We mixed up a flesh tone and then did our first coat on the inside. So once we'd done a couple of layers over the front and back halves, then it was a case of adding a thickened layer. So the idea is to mix up more of the same silicone uh, flesh color and then add a bit of thickener to it. Here we're using Zymeter Thixo, which is from Dow Corning, and it really does a nice job of thickening up silicone. This silicone, it's a platinum silicone, but this Thixo still works well with it. And the idea is to kind of get an even thickness of maybe six or seven millimeters all over. So we've got a nice even skin. Obviously, the thinner you make it, the less silicon you use, but then the harder it is to get out of the mold. So we've got to strike a balance between cost of material and ease of use. And this thickened layer ensures you get a nice even thickness everywhere. But then what we're going to do is this little trick of getting the foam that we're going to use later to stick to the silicone. So we push in some pre-cut strips of scrim or burlap, as it's sometimes called in the States. Uh, this, the fibers of this will bond to the silicone, um, but the backs of the fibers are still exposed and that will stick to the foam that we're going to use later. So once that's in, we then want to join the two halves. So we mix up an, a final batch of silicone with some Thixo and squeeze that all around the edge on both sides. And then the front and the back mold can be pushed together. Here you can see the molds going on and then we bolt them. And as you bolt them together, you're going to squish out that excess. And then we get a nice job of the seam filling with silicone, but it also helps join the two halves together so that they're one complete uh, piece of silicone now. And then before that stuff sets, I'm also going to put a final bit of scrim over that join so that every every part of this on the inside is completely attached to a piece of scrim, uh, the fibers of which are still sticking up on the back. And there we go. That's the completed task ready for filling. So we've got our head now completely siliconed. We've got our scrim stuck inside the, the last layer of silicone. And what we're going to do now is, my little trick is to suspend a piece of wood in there. So I've got a piece of 2x2 two two and I'm going to suspend it inside the center of the head. So it's not actually touching the top of the head there. It's, it's held in the correct position using a magic arm, which is a really cool little tool from Manfrotto. It's a photographer's tool. And it basically is literally that. It's an arm that you articulate to whatever angle you want. You've got clamps on there. You hold the piece of wood in position where you want it and then lock it off by twisting that lever there and it locks in place and now that piece of wood will remain in that position and then what we're going to do is mix up some expanding foam this is some soft foam uh, you mix that up pull that inside swill it round, and the wood will stay in the right position so it stays unattached to anything it stays suspended in the middle and the foam that we've swilled around it will kind of mix into the fibers of the scrim which the back side of that scrim of which is embedded in the silicone and now the foam will hold the wooden uh, strut in position it's stuck into the foam so it won't come apart and, the, and that then is fused to the silicone so when we do open this we will have a reasonably lightweight um, head with a silicon surface and this nice piece of wood in the center will act as a kind of a strong sort of armature to keep it upright so it doesn't collapse in or get damaged but it also gives you a mounting point so you can actually screw or bolt or secure this to a baseboard later because you've got a nice definite strong um, mounting point. And there we go. You can see we've done a couple of batches of foam. I don't like to do foam in one hit in case I mix up too much. So here we've done it in several little batches, swilled it round, made sure we've got everywhere. And now we just need to pop that open. So when we were done, Helen took it away to finish off and open up the mold, get the piece out. She seamed it and painted it up and then presented it at the 2019 prosthetics event. And it was great success. 
fabulous thank you very much for watching i hope you enjoyed that i hope that was useful to you and please do check out our podcast if you're interested in prosthetic makeup and the processes involved todd debrasini and myself produce a podcast called battles with bits of rubber it's wherever you find podcasts and we suggest you check it out subscribe and get in touch if you have any questions check out prosthetics magazine it's available online and in print and it's full of all kinds of information about prosthetic makeup 